In this video, we want to talk about something interesting about the maximum of the sequence the nth root of n. So let's take a look at this sequence. So that would be the first root of 1, and the second root of 2, and the third root of 3, the fourth root of 4, the fifth root of 5, etc. And now let's take a closer look at what that means. So the first root of 1 is obviously 1. The second root of 2, this is going to be approximate, but it's about 1.414. Now the third root of 3 is again approximately 1.442. And here's where it gets interesting, the fourth root of 4. Well, the fourth root of four is just the number that, when multiplied with itself four times, gives you four. But wouldn't that mean that if you mul only multiplied it half as many times, two times, it would give you two, right? So the interesting thing starts here. The fourth root of four is equal to the square root of two. So again, we're at 1.414. And the fifth root of five, is approximately 1.380. Now this sequence is going to converge to 1 with time, but that's not our concern in this video. Here we want to talk about the maximum, and more specifically where we are achieving a maximum in this sequence. So let's take a look at a graph. You see, I've written here the x root of x because now I'm considering instead of uh, just considering the natural numbers I'm now considering all numbers exclusively between 0 and infinity and we see that we first rise and rise and rise and at some point achieve a maximum and go down and down and down and down and down and as we said before this will get closer and closer and closer to 1. So you can see here this rise. We, have, we start at 1. We go up to 1.414 right here. We keep going up 1.442 and then at some point we must be going back down again because these two values are equal. The second value, the second uh, root of 2 and the fourth root of 4. So this looks rather symmetrical, doesn't it? As if the maximum is achieved at the third root of 3 and that the second root of 2 and the fourth root of 4 are on the way up respectively or down. But let's look at this a little bit closer. As I said, let's look at this as if we were considering all numbers x exclusively between 0 and infinity and see if we can find whether this is indeed the case that the maximum is achieved at the third root of 3 or is it maybe not as symmetrical as this would have us believe. So I have taken the liberty of computing some of these values as we saw before and we see that there is a maximum here. Now can we see exactly where it is? It looks like it's somewhere, it's hard to see exactly, somewhere around 3 maybe depending on the way I've made my dotted line here, maybe it's a little above 3 or maybe below 3. Uh, let's look at some more specific values. So with some more decimal points in here. So we see that this was our maximum that we had before, 1.442. We see now that if we go up beyond 3, these values start going down again and they actually only rose until here 2.75. So now this value looks like it's even a little higher than the value we had at the square root, uh, or the third root of 3 rather. So what could that be telling us? That means somewhere around 2.75 we're achieving a maximum value. So let's think about what, what that could be. 
what sort of number is around in that area that seems to be an important number. Yes, we're not thinking of pi, right? Pi would be a little bit above 3. We might be thinking of e, which is a little bit below 3. Is that 1828? 1828, and then like a 45, 90, 45 degree triangle. This value, maybe, 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 and it looks like we're hanging around this important number E, maybe we're going to have our maximum at E. Let's see if we can prove that. So let's consider this uh, function, the x root of x. We want to take the derivative, because if we can find when this is equal to 0, and that'll be telling us that this slope here is equal to zero, and that will be our maximum point. So we could just rewrite that as uh, x to the 1 over x, right? And we just take the derivative of that. And in order to do that, I'm going to raise e to the logarithm of that. In other words, I've changed absolutely nothing since e and the natural logarithm function just cancel each other out. But that's going to be an easier form for me to take the uh, derivative of. So the derivative, we're going to have to use the chain rule here, right? So the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. So in other words, I'm just going to rewrite that here. And then I'm going to need to multiply that by the derivative of this inside part, right? So the logarithm of x times 1 over x, or 2 to the 1 over x, the derivative of that. Okay, now this first part here we can already go ahead and simplify because as we said before, e and the logarithm just cancel out. So that gives us again this x to the 1 over x times, now I think I'm going to put this in a slightly different form using the rules for dealing with logarithms. I'll put this 1 over x in front, and I'll just be needing to be taking the derivative of that. So now, actually this I can just go ahead and put back in our normal form now. Right, this is just the same thing. Now we need to use the product rule to differentiate that. So 1 over x is just the same as x to the negative 1, right? So we'll just put our negative 1 in front, taking the derivative of this, and we'll lower our exponent, and then leave this part unchanged, plus, and now we'll leave that unchanged, and the derivative of the logarithm of x is just 1 over x. Okay, so now let's simplify. and We get the x root of x times, so what would that leave us? That would give us negative 1 over x squared times the logarithm of x plus 1 over x squared. So we could uh, factor something out here, right? We could factor out the 1 over x squared, and we would be in this situation now, that negative logarithm of x plus 1 would be in parentheses. Okay, so we said before we want to know when this is equal to 0. Well, this here is never going to be equal to 0. And this is also never going to be equal to 0. So the only time this derivative could ever be equal to 0 is if that's equal to 0. So let's figure out when that would be. Negative logarithm of x plus 1 being equal to 0 is the same thing as the logarithm of x being equal to 1, right? then I could just use both of these sides as an exponent for e. And again, since these two just cancel each other out, that gives me x equals e. So indeed, the place where the slope is equal to zero 
is exactly at E. So if we look just at the sequence, that is, considering the natural numbers, then the maximum does indeed occur at the third root of 3, which gives us the appearance of some symmetry here. But if we take a closer look, as you can see with these graphs, the actual maximum occurs at E. Interesting.